Hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome into this week's Mining Stock Daily Long Form episode. Uh, this is going to hit the airwaves in time for all of your traveling listening needs because a lot of people are going to be heading into Vancouver this week for take your pick the metals investor forum vancouver resource investment conference or the association for mineral exploration bc's roundup conference i will be in attendance for most of those days i look forward to seeing as many of you as possible so while you travel kick in and listen to this conversation with sprott's john hathaway legendary iconic figure in the gold and gold mining business we have a lot of good things to discuss regarding the healthiness of the gold price, the healthiness of the gold mining equities and their value, and really this backdrop of Federal Reserve policy, its interest rates, and this kind of disconnect between their expectations and also market expectations. So there are a lot of good takeaways and things to listen into with my conversation with John. I'm glad we can make that happen. Special thank you to Visa Silver, Fireweed Metals, Arizona Sonoran Copper, and Victoria Gold for their continued support of the podcast. And if you, the listener, wouldn't mind, you could help us out by hitting that five-star review on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get this podcast. We greatly appreciate it. All right, everybody, let's jump into my conversation with John Hathaway of Sprott. All right, I'm happy to welcome in John Hathaway. He's the managing partner over at Sprott Inc., and he's also a portfolio manager with Sprott Asset Management, and he's no stranger to the precious metal sector, including all things physical metals and the mining stocks. John, it is an honor to have you on this podcast. Thanks, Trevor. Looking forward to our chat. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've been somewhat of an admirer and reader of yours here for the last couple of years. Uh, it's a shame that, that it's taken me so long to get you onto this podcast because I'm sure we have could have had a lot of really great conversations over the last couple of years. Uh, but because this is your first time, I think it's only appropriate that maybe we uh, talk in, kind of bust into your career and talk about why precious metals and how you've made such a fantastic living following this sector. Uh, well, I mean, I started in this business in the nineteen in nineteen seventy as a generalist uh, and also as a sell side analyst with uh, two firms that are no longer in existence. The la- the last one, William D. Witter, merged into Drexel Burnham, um, and uh, that was in the late seventies. And I moved on to after that to David J. Green, which was a value shop money manager. Um, and, you know, I was basically a PM uh, for Green and then moved on to the Rosenwald family office. So it's a long career. So I didn't really start my current gig until 1998 at Tocqueville Asset Management, which was a contrarian value shop. And I said to my friend and partner, Robert Kleinschmidt, who was a partner of mine at David Green, uh, you know, gold is really in the toilet. And why don't we start a gold fund? And Robert and his other partner, Francois, kind of thought it over for 30 seconds and said, yeah, that's a great contrarian idea. So we started the Tocqueville Gold Fund in 1998 with $10 million and it grew to 3 billion uh, by 2011 or so. Um, So I've been doing this for over 25 years or just about 25 years. And um, four years ago, Tocqueville decided to sell my business to Sprott. So that's where I am now but I haven't changed my stripes. I've just changed my address. <laughs> uh, from one contrarian investment firm to another, it seems like. Let me ask you about kind of – you mentioned you, you saw gold as being in the tank there when you started that fund, and that would be the contrarian thesis. You know, how much – did you do some deep dives into 
the compelling nature of gold as an investment at that time, or did you just see the price and were like, this is completely beat up? No, we, uh, we obviously did a lot of research, but the, uh, the clincher was the British government selling gold. I think it was $250 an ounce. Um, and the chancellor of the exchequer was a guy named Gordon Brown. So that low will always be known as the brown bottom uh, for the gold price. And, uh, you know, from there, from 250, it went to 1900, up sevenfold over the next decade and a, and a half. Uh, and then obviously it had a pullback and it's sort of been mired in a trading range for the last 10 years, although um, it's kind of broken above that. And um, we took a look at year end to see how gold had done over 25 years. And it turns out that it's done better than the S&P, even including yeah. invested uh, investment income re reinvested. So, you know, gold is, is hated. It's hated by most investors. Um, it's hated by the uh, investment establishment, uh, the orthodox uh, thought process that you get out of the big um, investment firms, Morgan Stanley, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's been a pretty good place to be. And, uh, you know, I just think it's on its way to much higher prices. Uh, we can talk about that, but uh, it's been under the radar for most people. And, and the level of interest, the interesting thing, and I'll shut up in a second, um, is that Gold has made new highs this year. It's had, I forget how many weekly closes over 2000 without any interest from Western investors. It's all Asia. It's all uh, central banks um, and no help at all from the same crowd that basically pushed gold to new highs over 10 years ago uh, when the gold ETF was formed um, back in 2004. So hmm. my guess is that when retail and, and, and institutional sentiment in this part of the world becomes more uh, favorably inclined to look at gold, their interest could drive it to a big, big number. And it's a lot more and probably a multiple of where we're trading today. I mean, through this uh, career, this this 20, 30 year career you've had here, John, watching the movement in gold, that there has been numerous times where it has a lot of attention and a thing really, really moves. And you can go back to, you know, 2010, 2011 would be probably one of the most recent times where it really, really moved. Um, and then, you know, it's in this lull of just, like you said, nobody cares. The Western retail uh, investment crowd doesn't care. A lot of the institutions don't care and they let it sit. And it's, it's, it is that almost forgotten relic at times. Um, you know, so what, when you see, how do you kind of, with all this practice you have and patience you must have, you know, what do you see when, it, you, how do you kind of gauge when sentiment continues to improve? Are there, you know, little headlines or, you know, things you notice when you're about to see more of a retail crowd jumping into the precious metal sector? Sure. I mean, there, there are lots of gauges that we look at. There's uh, Jake Bernstein's Daily Sentiment Index. Um, I think Market Vane has an index. So, you know, there, there are objective benchmarks of interest. Uh, DSI is pretty volatile, so the better one is... Um, um, is the second one that I mentioned. Um, but the, I guess another way to uh, gauge sentiment is flows into or out of gold-backed ETFs. And um, basically they were flat in 23, but um, mm -hmm. uh, over the last five years, Outflows have been, I think, 17%. So 17% of AUMs in gold-backed ETFs have disappeared over the last five years, even though the gold price has gone up. 
Yeah, it, it's just it's – it's actually it's pretty remarkable. <laughs> what about the uh, challenging for the uh, title of safe assets here? You know, you talk about its, it's competitiveness with uh, the bond market, which supposedly has been historically safe, and we can maybe have that conversation if whether you still say that's a safe, risk-free investment that it once was. And then also, you know, the Bitcoin crowd and how much – of a market is uh, these cryptocurrencies taking away uh, from f- from the gold investment. I mean, general thoughts about the competitiveness here of gold. Okay, so bonds versus uh, gold. Um, gold basically wins no contest. I mean, bonds are supposedly were supposedly a safe asset, and uh, I don't have the numbers at the top of my head, but they did not perform in 22. They didn't perform really until the end of 23. And so the idea that you could have a balanced portfolio with 60% stocks, 40% bonds, I think that's been shot to smithereens, unfortunately, for the bond side of the equation. And I I could talk more about bonds um, uh, if you want to, but uh, you you asked about Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is is interesting. I think it 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 has a role. Investors come to it for the same reasons investors come to gold, which is basically it's a way to get out of paper currencies. Uh, and I wouldn't dispute that at all. Um, obviously, Bitcoin is controversial. Um, it's in its early days, and I think we'll just see. I mean, I I'm not necessarily against Bitcoin. I think the the tent for those who would who see the flaws of paper currency is getting bigger all the time. And I think there's room for Bitcoin and I think there's room for gold as well. So I'm not going to get into a, um, a, a debate about whether Bitcoin belongs or not. I think people come to it for the right reason. It's just a different answer than than gold, but it's the same, it's an answer to the same question. Uh, so um, that's a quick, quick and dirty rundown on bonds and Bitcoin versus gold. It would have been amazing to kind of be in the office twenty years ago, and and having a conversation about precious metals, and somebody turns their head and says, "Well, what happens if they create these digital currencies?" You know, I think right. that would have made some oh. head spin in the office. For sure. at the time. Yeah, no, it's uh, <laughs> no, it's it's, it's it, it, quite a story. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, look, let's jump into maybe the present market here that we're seeing in precious metals, and kind of talk about the back backdrop. You know, fundamentally, uh, John, like I, I'm seeing things I. Uh, I'm incre- I personally am incredibly bullish on precious metals heading into this year. Uh, in fact, it seems like there's a really good setup and reasons for it to to move higher. Not to say it's going to move in a straight line, and we're obviously seeing that this week. But there is, you know, we have to keep our heads on a swivel here. And there's a lot of different expectations, and I'm, I'd like to kind of know how you are seeing this pen, pan out. Uh, you know, back in December in the Federal Reserve meeting, uh, that will forever be known as the Jerome Powell pivot, uh, whether it was overdone or not is yet to be seen because the market expectations, I think, are about close to about six rate cuts here in 2024. Uh, the Fed expectations is three. <clears throat> so there's a huge sway here. Um, maybe that has been tampered a little bit this week with some of the data that's been come that's came out. But, you know, a lot of this seems like the possible headwind for precious metals, indeed, that the higher for longer type narrative could be in place for at least the next couple of months. And I'm just kind of curious how you're watching this. Well, obviously, I pay attention to it because the narrative of higher interest rates has been a headwind for gold, and it has been for quite quite a while. But uh, gold has gone up even though interest rates have got have have gotten higher, I mean we're we're at what five percent or so on the short end, um, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it really gold hasn't budged. So I think that this this stuff you hear out of the Fed 
they're it's more jawboning than um, anything else. Uh, and and you and you're right. I mean, uh, this recent little pullback we've had to test two thousand uh, is a direct result of um, Fed commentary that the you know the market's gotten too ahead of itself in terms of pricing in rate cuts. But these guys are always wrong. And um, I think you just have to take a step back and say, you know, and, and the, one thing I've learned is that um, the jiggles that you get on a day-to-day basis, these $50 swings in the gold price, $20, $50, um, you have to take a step back and, and see that the average price of gold on an annual basis has risen by over 20% over the last 10 years. Um, and, um, you know, so technicians make a living getting people to trade on, form, you know, head and shoulder formations or, or whatever they, 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 uh, they dream up. But the, but the bigger story, in my opinion, is gold has climbed steadily for the last 10 years, and actually for the last 25 years. Um, obviously, year in, year out, I mean, there are twists and turns, and I pay attention to it. You have to. But the longer-term story is the U.S. dollar is losing value, um, and that's reflected in a steadily rising gold price. So, um you know, we should be talking about why is the dollar losing value? And um, it's more than just infl- inflation, um, but um, inflation is certainly a part of it. Um, inflation has come down. It may go negative for a while, but at the end of the day, and you mentioned Powell's pivot back in uh, December, he has pivoted. And every time the Fed has pivoted, and I'd go back to the dot-com crash, the global financial crisis, and COVID. Take those three. Gold has rocketed, um, and uh, uh, gold stocks have gone up even more. You did mention in this last note that you published at Sprott.com and in your um, gold report blog, and I think that is published every quarter John, you mentioned that this federal pivot back in December it appears to be more political than it was fundamental. Uh, maybe talk about the political the politicalization of this move. I, yeah, that's a good point um, because the, the ones previous, I think, were pretty much decided by the Fed, um, and we could go back and don't have the time to do it, but examine each and every one of them. But this one, what was interesting is the day before the FOMC meeting, and I forget the exact dates in December, but Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, made a very subtle hint that monetary policy was too tight. She said that because inflation is coming down, real rates are going up. And the Fed would have to take that into consideration in deciding how to move forward on their on their restrictive monetary policy. And so I don't think it's a big coincidence that uh, at that meeting, Powell said, basically, we're done. I, don't, I forget his exact words, but we're done raising rates. Um, and now there's been a little kerfluffle about well, is it going to be six rate cuts or three rate cuts? But the point is, they didn't do this because Powell and the rest of them think they've won the battle on inflation. They did it under, and this is my opinion, but you, you could look at what Yellen said and, you know, the sequence. Uh, there was political pressure. So, you know, if there's a policy mistake ahead and they abandon their policy of uh, tight money uh, too soon and declare victory over inflation, uh, the mistake could be that um, 
that it was a it was a false victory lap, and inflation is going to come back, and we're going to be in the same soup again with the Fed having to tighten money in an election year. I I don't think they will. I just think they will gradually wind down the the level of uh, the federal funds rate. Uh, but uh, that could be happening against a backdrop of stubbornly high inflation. You know, not the 2% they would like, but maybe 3%, 3.5%. Yeah. Uh, when the Fed, and Jerome Powell and the Fed did pivot, there's so many uh, similarities people were posting online with the uh, President George Bush mission accomplish on the aircraft carrier right. uh, side. Yeah, no, that's probably um, right. Yeah, and you know, we obviously can look back and realize how premature that was. Uh, but this this Federal Reserve is is no different. I mean, I, you could, don't have to go back very long to talk about transitory inflation and that uh, committee being very late to challenge the inflationary pressures. And obviously, they came in very hot and heavy to do so uh, when inflation was pushing up to you know double digits. And we come to this time, and now it almost seems like your, your concern is that they're too early uh, to call mission accomplished as well. And, right. you know, John, we, similarities back to the 60s and 70s, we saw multi uh, stages of that inflationary pressure before things just got completely out of hand. Are you seeing similarities with this bout of inflation that we saw in the late 60s and into the 70s? Well, the. Uh... There are parallels, but I would say that the the macro picture for um, I think we have to talk about the U.S. dollar. The macro picture mm -hmm. for the U.S. dollar is way worse today than it was ten years ago, twenty years ago, fifty years ago. Fifty years ago, debt to GDP was probably thirty percent. Today, it's one hundred and twenty percent. So debt is um, at the at the at the at the uh, national level, is uh, almost in banana republic territory. Um, you know what's you know one consequence of that is that we are spending more on interest than we're spending on defense. Um, just one example. So, to me, where we are today is unsustainable, and. Um, uh, I'm not sure how it all winds up, but it seems to me that more and more the 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 the, the logic of holding wealth in in dollar in a hundred percent in dollars doesn't make sense. And you can look at what foreign our trading partners and adversaries are doing. They're they're selling their treasuries, they're selling um, things with the dollar sign in front of it. Basically, so they uh, and they see the they they see one. We talked about bonds having performed poorly, so bonds are no longer sort of the gilded safe asset, blue chip asset they were thought to be, and that's obvious. Maybe more to um, foreign governments than it is to um, investors on Main Street. Uh, so. Um, what does that mean? That means that um, the BRIC nations, which um, are a huge percentage of global the global economy, are settling their trades in gold and not in U.S. dollars. They're not recycling into petrodollars the way they did going back to the 1970s. And um, so the by default, the settlement is being done in gold. So again, that, that that would explain why foreign central banks are buying gold hand over fist at a higher rate than any time in history. Uh, again, all taking place without any participation by uh, investors in the U.S. or Europe. Uh, you know, one of those uh, what used to be a large purchaser of, of U.S. Treasuries now turned uh, uh to, to the to the sale button is China, uh, and I, you know I, I think this is a timely question here, John. And by no means do I expect you to be an expert on Chinese markets by any means, but it's a pretty ugly looking market and economy that's we're seeing 
uh, out of China. And, you know, I think you could make the argument that it appears that, you know, despite being kind of some jaded and, 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 and opaque economic data, you could probably make the argument that China is currently in a recession. Um, so my follow-up question here is based on what we're seeing here in the West. Is there concern that we will see um, a little bit of contagion out of the Chinese market and eventually hitting having a recessionary pressures into Western societies and economies uh, here in uh, you know in the next couple months? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, China's have it, it, there are articles all over the place. Wall Street Journal being a good example about deflation uh, affecting China. Um, and where does that go? Well, I mean, it's certainly not good for the economic outlook outside of China, given the amount of trade that uh, goes back and forth. Europe, also uh, same thing. Uh, very, very poor uh, performance economically. And so this idea that Powell's going to stick a soft landing. I, I would challenge that. Uh, there's so much evidence away from the government generated stats, which is, which is basically they're all, not each and every one of them, but so many of them are political, are massage for political purposes. Um, and I could name a bunch of them, uh, CPI, um, uh, the employment report that comes out on Fridays once a month, all of that, those numbers have to be taken with a grain of salt. So I would be I would be more in the cat in the in the um, camp that uh, which is a very minority view that we're headed for a recession. Uh, I read uh, David Rosenberg's commentary this morning. It hasn't been derailed; it's just been delayed. Uh, <laughs> and he thinks we'll see uh, a recession. I know a number of other economists that I think very highly of are in that camp. But it certainly isn't what you hear when you turn on your Bloomberg or CNBC. So let's just see how this plays out. You mentioned a couple of strong economic numbers. I guess retail sales uh, was one. Mm -hmm. um, industrial production was another surprisingly good. But, um, uh, you know, these monthly numbers uh, are quite volatile. And, uh, you know, as long as these interest rates stay as high as they are, just talk about the 5% um, on the, on the uh, short end of the curve, that means that a lot of debt that was financed in the decade of zero interest rates has to be refinanced at not 5% because that's the government credit, probably 7, 8, 9%. And, if it, and these credits are, 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 um, are, get, are going sour just based on the level of interest rates. And if you pile on top of that a, uh, an economic slowdown, well, you, then you have poor business conditions plus higher interest rates. And that's the kind of thing that could create sort of a panicky move to lower, to, you know, crash interest rates by the Fed. Uh, and I think at that point in time, you would see gold really take off. Whether a soft landing happens and the Fed feels safe to pivot or a hard landing happens and the Federal Reserve is forced to cut interest rates, it definitely feels there is a bias towards easing this year. And I yes. think that more or less the, sums up the, the bull thesis. It's the pace. Yeah, it's the for, pace. for precious People middle. are arguing about the pace, but the direction, I think, is pretty much there's unanimity on the fact that rates aren't going higher, they're going lower, and then the argument is about how fast. Yeah. Which is an interesting narrative with the political backdrop we have here, John, because obviously we have an incumbent who wants to see a strong economy as he heads into re-election and uh, Donald Trump, who most likely at this point in the election, we will see a uh, challenge for that position back. And he's a real estate developer and not 
unfamiliar with yeah. <laughs> refinancing Not real estate, uh, real estate projects. Like high interest rates. Right. And so into that, I mean, even, either one of those situations still is even – a more bias to ease depending on the political situation. I do not see any sort of reason why any of those individuals would elect to keep interest rates higher for longer. Do you, I mean, am I crazy no. to think this? No, no. And I think, uh, uh, the surprise again, you know, I'm in the minority on this, but if we have a recession recession, uh, ahead of us as Rosenberg and others are saying, who have a pretty good record of being right over the long term, um, then rates are kind of come down a lot faster than anyone thinks. Um, business conditions will be poor. Earnings will not be uh, what uh, consensus expectations are. Um, one guy that I talked to said, you know, $230 for the S&P uh, the only thing wrong with it is the two. It's going to be more like a one in front of the 30. Um, so a big, a big reduction in earnings. And where does that, what does that do for equity valuations? Um, it's probably not good. And again, this is why um, a lot of people may look for other answers than owning um, mainstream uh, kinds of stocks. So, you know, this 24 is going to be really interesting on, on a bunch of fronts. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the gold miners. I know you've got a lot of uh, opinions and analysis on the gold miners. It's, it's an interesting week to be having this conversation because we did have uh, production numbers out of the second largest producer. That would be Barrick Gold. Uh, they've been taking it to the teeth this week because of a lower than expected production numbers and obviously seeing uh, their inflationary costs continue to rise. And therefore a lot of the other major gold producers are, are, are getting stuck in the, in the group as well. Uh, seeing a little bit of selling. Uh, I know you're not the one to check the day to day volatility. Your thesis has always been, uh, you know, uh, long and uh, bullish for long. But let me ask you, you know, really about any surprises you've seen on inflationary pressures when it comes to the cost of producing an ounce of gold lately. Yeah, costs are coming down. Uh, I We don't own Barrick. I don't follow it. Uh, our group doesn't follow it. Uh, so I don't know quite what their issues were. I, I wish I had checked on this before this call, but I, I, I frankly... Uh, many of the companies that we do own have come out with surprisingly good results in terms of production, cost guidance, uh, et cetera. So we had a conversation with a company this morning uh, that has, and this is extreme, um, is going to produce a free cash flow yield of almost 20%, which is... Mm. You know, if you're a value investor, which I have always been, um, that's it doesn't get much better than that. Um, now, not each and every gold mining stock has those kind of numbers, but uh, uh, most of these companies today are generating cash and in many cases free cash. Uh, and, uh, you know, if the gold price hangs around where we are today, uh, they'll have record cash flow in 24. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that the average gold price has gone up by over 20% over the last 10 years. Um, if we stay at this level, that'll probably continue that streak. We don't need to go a lot higher for these companies to knock the ball out of the park in terms of earnings and um the other metrics that people care about. One thing we haven't mentioned is dividend yields. You know, this group provides yields that are very competitive with, uh, if you just take the S&P generically, I think the uh, it's not hard to find good companies providing dividend yields of 4% or more. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying there are stocks for widows and orphans, but again, it's just another... <laughs> benchmark of, of value and safety, a margin of safety that you don't have 
with uh, so many other stocks that you could be looking at. Well, John, who has the upper hand here in this in this type of market? Is it the big conglomerate, massive metals, gold producers, or is it the, I guess, more or less to classify those mid-tier producers that are, you know, smaller, a little bit more nimble? Well, we like the latter category. I mean, we do own a few of the big cap names, but um, I think the uh, value creation that you see is more evident in mid cap and smaller cap companies. And they've, they've been the better performers. You mentioned Barrick. Um, I hate to say it, but it's been a disappointing stock uh, ever since Mark Bristow took over. Um, and he'd be the first to tell you that. Um, Newmont uh, is okay. They've just made a big acquisition of Newcrest. Um, a lot of sorting out to be done there. So I think that stock is probably uh, in limbo for a while. But there are many things that we own where they're producing more than they did last year and will produce more in this year than they did last year and next year. And at cost, at a, on a cost profile uh, that allows them to generate piles of cash flow. Uh, so really bullish um, bullish uh, earnings picture without hypothesizing a higher gold price. And if gold prices, God forbid, if they were to go up by 100 or $200, which I think they could, um, you know, it's lights out for the kind of numbers these, these companies are going to going to uh, provide. How do you approach jurisdictional risk within those companies? Do you stick with, you know, favorable U.S., Canada? Uh, do you dabble going into a little bit, I guess would be perceived as a little bit riskier jurisdictions? Well, we, no, we, we handle jurisdictional issues very gingerly and we're, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, there's no question that uh, the world has shrunk from a mining point of view in terms of safety. Um, and so many countries that were deemed to be um, safe jurisdictions even 10 years ago were off, off the radar. Um, so Australia, U.S. and Canada, um, I would say represent... Uh, two-thirds to 70% of the portfolio of our gold fund, the Sprott uh, Gold Fund. Um, and do we dabble? We're always interested because you see some incredible values. Uh, and there are countries that nobody pays any attention to. Um, Cambodia would be an example where mining, the mining laws are fine. And it's, But again, that's not for generalists. Most of the generalists and maybe people tuning into this have really only heard about Barrick, Newmont, Agnico, um, and it's a short list. And uh, other than Agnico, I um, I can understand why there's not um, a lot of love for for the for the gold stock space. Um, Agnico mm -hmm. being the exception in the big cap part of the market. But there are, as I say, quite a few companies that have uh, good assets and good jurisdictions that are extremely un um, undervalued, which uh, I believe when money does want to flow in, um, and it hasn't yet for sure, but when it does, uh, these, are, these will be the kinds of stocks that will be the best performers. And not that um, the ones that I mentioned, the big cap names won't perform well, but the, the smaller to mid cap names uh, that we are really specialists in will be the, uh, uh, the better uh, place from a performance point of view. Yeah. I mean, we've seen valuations on late stage developers and projects get absolutely crushed the last couple of years here, John. When it comes to mergers and acquisitions. I mean, you did mention the new Mont new crest deal, uh, in, in your previous, uh, 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 comments, but 
you know, with these valuations, are you at all surprised you haven't seen more M and A activity? I mean, there has been some. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of very cheap companies out there, and I'm just wondering if maybe you're surprised some of these bigger cap type of companies haven't seized the opportunity to pick up on some of those. Yeah, no, I think you're going to see it. I mean, there, um, there have been, I think there's been more M&A at the s- s- small cap level than, you know, meets the eye. It just doesn't make the, the news. But uh, Dundee Precious Metals, uh, for example, made an acquisition of uh, Osino. Um, mm-hmm. on a very uh, accretive basis, mainly mainly cash, some stock. Um, so I think you will see uh, another one I could mention would be Caliber buying Marathon. Um, and those two examples, I would say, are very accretive and, and beneficial to shareholders on each side of the equation. So I think that I think the time is ripe, especially with... Um, so many bargains lying around for uh, intelligent M and A. Again, I don't count the Newmont uh, Newcrest merger as as being. I'm not saying it was a bad merger, but it's not the kind of merger that really will obviously create value in the short run. Maybe over a longer period of time, some uh, that'll be evident. But there, some of the ones that we're seeing. The small cap space have an immediate benefit, and we can see a re-rate coming within a year. Mm-hmm. Hey, you, in in your last note, actually, this was something that surprised me because you mentioned the the caliber mining acquisition of Marathon, and you said that the information circular stated that there was many as twenty counterparties that expressed potential in acquiring Marathon. So obviously right. Caliber wasn't the only one. There was a handful of other companies interested. And your thesis is, well, if those other 19 companies didn't get their hands on Marathon, they're not done shopping. No, if, really they get, if, they, if they struck out, this is this is history of m and I mean, you know, you know, the, the rejected lover still is sort of in, you know, his blood is up, his or her blood is up. <laughs> <laughs> to probably use a, a you know r- risque analogy, uh, and so they're 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 still on the hunt. So you know, I think we'll see. As I say, I think we'll see a lot of activity in this space this year. Can you share any like ideas of you know specific companies that you maybe think might be on the uh, maybe on the block for acquisition? No, I really shouldn't because that would get into okay. get, that would sort of breach the compliance. Um, All right, L- um, last thing we need is sprout lawyers to come. Uh, knock we don't. We door, don't need so. that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me deal with that. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for thanks for putting a stop to that before it went too far. Uh, you kind of mentioned a little bit. You know, we we have seen a couple interesting news in the exploration front, John. I know you don't. You know. Your thesis is more on the product, the the gold and metals production, not necessarily the expiration. But despite the the, the really crummy market last year, we did see a few good uh, exploration discoveries, some good work on the ground, getting rewarded by the market. Uh, there are a few and far between, obviously. Um, you know, but in the last couple of days, we've seen all, you know more good news as far as strategic investments and changing deals from you know minority ownership to royal to royalties. I mean, if you had like advice or maybe some thoughts about the junior exploration sector right now, you know, what would you share with a with a room full of people that are that dabble in in, in uh, drill core? Uh, I would say uh, you know. It, takes a lot of patience. We've seen how torturous building a new mine can be in an environment where it's impossible to raise equity. And basically your only recourse is to uh, dilute the asset by selling off uh, interest, royalty interest, streaming interest, that kind of thing. Um, And at the end of the day, you know, if you do too much of that, there's not a whole lot left for the the equity interest in in a situation. So it's very, very tough today 
you know, you're at the wrong end of the Lausanne curve, which is basically, you know, a discovery that has to become a mine, has to go through this gauntlet of um, um, unknown delays from permitting and, uh, um, you know, financing. That's what happened to Marathon. Marathon, a terrific asset, uh, was destroyed in the market by um, these conditions. And then perhaps maybe not just the best judgment on the part of the, of the former management in terms of when to raise money and, and how to go about it. So it's very, very tricky. I'm not saying that you sh- that an investor shouldn't have an interest in the space, but just be cognizant of ha- what a challenge it is at a time like this. Um, and, um, you know, that's kind of my sermon on the juniors. I think when, when you have valuations as incredibly attractive as they are for producers generating free cash, uh, rising uh, earnings, they're, and they're already in production, you don't necessarily need to take the additional risk of investing in a junior that may have a couple of good drill holes. Maybe they have a lot of good drill holes, but the end of the at the end of the day, they have to go out to the market and find uh, capital to build, or they have to find a merger mm-hmm. partner. Now, you know, some of those that do have world class discoveries and they do exist, um, those would be the ones we're interested in. But frankly, uh, the barrier for our interest in those kind of names is is much higher than it ever was because existing producers are so attractively priced. And so we don't need to take that additional risk. I'm I'm not saying there aren't exceptions, but my preference today in terms of producer versus junior drilling kind of stories would be for producers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would. I know we got only have a few minutes left here, John, and so I, I've got to ask about uranium. <laughs> it's just what a wild ride this has been. Um, you know, in, in, in your institution had had launched the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, and obviously that is doing incredibly well over the last couple of months. Uh, last I saw, it was above thirty three dollars a share here. Um, I, you know, uh, the, uh, the team at Sprott saw the opportunity here to get this vehicle in place, obviously was able to look two or three years down the road. Um, you know, talk about this market. I mean, if, you, if there's anything you can share, I know you're more of a precious metals and mining guy, but this, this uranium market's something you, it's hard to ignore right now. Well, frankly, as a shareholder of Sprott, I'm really glad that, um, the uh, uh, the uh, powers that be at Sprott saw this opportunity and uh, executed uh, very well. I think uranium is as much as 30% of Sprott's AUM. Our, our AUMs are roughly 30 billion right now. And uh, order of magnitude, uranium is, is, is a third of that. And that I think is probably uh, obviously more uh, responsible for the stock's performance than precious metals, which are out of favor. So uh, just imagine what would happen if precious metals got a bid and uranium continued to do what it's doing. I think, um, I I guess I shouldn't be making a commercial for Sprott, but I guess I am. Um, But also in answer to your question, I am not the person at Sprott to talk to on uranium. We have some very... (laughs) some very well-versed experts on the subject. And uh, you should probably try to book them on a future podcast. I, I know they'd be happy to do it. Uh, and we have had them on before, including our, our other partner podcast, Going Nuclear, I do with Justin Hewn. We've had John Champagley on before. Oh, actually, okay. the inaugurate, so, Yeah, the inaugurative he, interv- uh, he's episode. He's the one that's radioactive. I mean, he's... he's <laughs> yeah. you, know, you talk uh, about that. Uh, but, you know, but I think the thing is, is you know, the, you know, the the uranium investors 
understood the fundamentals behind the nuclear fuel cycle and where supply was going to come from and saw this happening. Um, you know, and obviously everything played out. I think what precious metals investors and maybe it's, it's a lot less on supply and demand, but a little bit more fundamentally in regards to the supply and cost of capital, what we're seeing, it could see a fundamental move higher in the price of precious metals and gold moving forward. I mean, I don't know if you call this uranium market euphoria right now or not. Obviously, it's it's gone really high really quick. But, I mean, I think – is there expectations that the gold market could possibly sh- uh, you know mirror this similar move that the uranium market has done? Well, I mean, again, if we go back to some of our earlier uh, conversation, I would say it's it's – gold is doing great without any help from most people in the U.S. or Europe. Um, it's all Asian, it's all central banks. Uh, imagine, uh, what could happen if, and there are lots of reasons, uh, to say this could happen. Uh, if the crowd that drove gold to new highs over 10 years ago gets interested again. Um, and, uh, you know, gold is more of a macro story. It's harder and it's more controversial uranium. Uh, again, I should stay away from it, but it's it it, it is it, it is supply and demand story. Um, it's a great story, um, uh, but the nuances there are not as uh, difficult to discern as it is for precious metals. Basically, precious metals have been out of favor for the last ten years, even though they've done really well, uh, particularly gold, uh, less so silver. Um, again, it's a macro story. Uh, it's got a lot of, uh, aspects to it that are maybe not as easily grasped as, as, a, as something like uranium. But, um, if you dig into it as I have, um, and again, the, 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 the core thesis for precious metals is the long-term debasement of paper currency. I mean, I have a hard time seeing that going away. A little political discussion, uh, I thought, tied a nice bow on that. Um, so it's just going to take, it's taken a long time, much longer than I ever would have thought. But I do believe that when uh, more Western investors decide they need to have some exposure here, both to the metal and to the shares, the related shares, there's a huge amount of performance to come. And uh, hopefully this will be the year. Uh, I think the setup is great. I tried to explain why in my year-end letter, which you kindly uh, alluded to. And uh, hopefully some of our listeners will go to that and decide for themselves. John, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for doing this. We've taken up most of the hour, so I should probably uh, let you go. And, and hopefully you and I can catch up later this year and see how this gold market has panned out for the rest of 2024. Uh, thanks so much for your time and uh, best well, of luck. Thank you, Trevor. Yeah, great chat. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, you can find John's work over at Sprott.com uh, under the Insights tab. He publishes the Sprott Gold Report every quarter. Uh, and that's a wrap for us here this week on Mining Stock Daily. Uh, we'll be reporting from Vancouver from the V-RIC and also Roundup conferences. So stay tuned for that all week next week. <laughs>